have this. So, Identity Server, for the longest time, has been a piece of free open source software in the .NET ecosystem. Uh, it's basically an open ID and OAuth 2.0 token server. Um, by the way, token servers are a ridiculously nasty problem. Uh, either you should go ahead and outsource that to the cloud, <laughs> uh, or you should use a service like Identity Server to help you manage that locally. Uh, it is, it's, it's a pain in the butt problem. So historically, Identity Server had been a totally free as in beer uh, product that was all licensed, I believe, either under MIT or Apache 2. Uh, can't quite recall. So, one of the things they decided they were going to go ahead and do is, in order to make Identity Server a sustainable open source project, they decided to go ahead. In fact, I guess I'm flipping between blog posts here. They decided, I'll go ahead and scroll down through this, to go ahead and move from being totally free product to being a product that's going to get moved towards a proprietary licensing model in the future. So as I scroll down here, they've been open source for 10 years. They've maintained a very professional quality of management around the project. Their project's very well adopted. It's included in a bunch of the default Microsoft templates. At every single NDC conference, these guys give a paid workshop on how to do identity stuff. Uh, they are among one of the most successful groups in the entire .NET open source ecosystem. So with that as kind of the stage I'm setting here, let's break down the numbers. So Identity Server, in terms of the money that it has received from open source sponsorships, so GitHub or Open Collective or something, over the past three years, they've accumulated $60,000 from 75 monthly sponsors. 53,000 of that came from 12 companies. 7,000 came from 63 individuals. This breaks down to approximately $9,000 per year for each of us. Um, that is not a lot of money for a software developer in just about any part of the world. Um, well, I take that back. Um, some parts of the world, it's actually, that's, you can get by with it, um, but in places like Europe and the United States and other, let's say, other countries that have a relatively high cost of living, that's not going to get you a lot of mileage. So ultimately, sponsorship was not sustainable. So they were going to go ahead and move towards, I believe it's an RGPL model. If I scroll down here, uh, RPL, sorry, reciprocal public license. Basically, the way RPL works behind the scenes is this a type of copyleft license? In fact, let me see if I can pull up the language for RPL. See if I can grab that real fast. There we go. Copyleft software license released in 2020, uh, 2001. And let's see where the text is. The privacy loophole. So basically, the RPL... So there's two different licenses you tend to see show up in open source projects that want to move towards a paid licensing model. RPL is one of them. The AGPL, uh, Faro GNU public license is the other one. So a couple of other popular open source projects in the .NET ecosystem like N Service Bus and RavenDB use AGPL. So RPL is kind of the other big one that's out there. So a copy left license in terms of what that means means that basically anything that you write on top of the RPL software also itself has to be made open source. Otherwise you're in violation of the license. That includes any derivative libraries, but also any software as a service or standalone apps that you build all have to be it. So RPL tends to be combined with a dual licensing model, uh, which means that if you wanna use the software in a context where it's not open source, you have to go ahead and buy a commercial license. Uh, this is what companies like N Service Bus uh, and um, RavenDB and a couple of others have done. So uh, this came, you know, of course, as a bit of a bit of a surprise to some people in the .NET ecosystem. But from the point of view of someone, uh oh, sorry, we got a little visit from the cat here. Um, from the point of view of someone who's you know, been, been involved in the .NET, let's say. Um, the .NET open source, you know, business ecosystem for a while. 
not that surprising. Uh, donations are hilariously unsustainable, and we will do an entire episode on that at some point in the future. So the bottom line is, if I scroll up here, let's see. They have mentioned their time frame on here somewhere. What they're going to go ahead and do... All right, here we go. This is what I was looking for. The current version of Identity Server, version 4, will be the last version we work on as a free open source project. We'll keep supporting Identity Server 4 until end of life of .NET Core 3.1 in November 2022. But then uh, Identity Server 5 will be licensed under RPL. So I wanted to go ahead and discuss a little bit about the community's reaction to this, uh, what I think about it, and where I think uh, the .NET ecosystem is kind of going to go. Because there was an interesting announcement that Microsoft made last week on the tail end of this. Now, this was, you know, October 1st, 2020. So this is like seven months later. So there's been quite a bit of time passed since this original announcement and uh, Microsoft's one that came out earlier this week. And I'll go ahead and pull up Microsoft's announcement. ASP.NET Core 6 and authentication servers. And this is... Um, well, on Twitter, Blowdart, Barry Durans, he's sort of the security guy for ASP.NET. So, long story short, give some backstory about shipping identity server 4, dot, 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 dot. dot .NET 6, which is the next new um, long-term support version of .NET. Now, in case you're not familiar with what that means, um, .NET has moved as I say an annual release cycle just about for the major version of the runtime. And so .NET Core 3.1 has long-term support up until November 2022. So that's like about a three-year window roughly of support uh, for when it was first launched. .NET 5, which came out last fall, does not have long-term support. Meaning that if you're using .NET 5 in production, you're kind of on you're kind of on your own. So .NET 6, the next major version of .NET that enjoys long-term support, is going to go ahead and take a dependency on the RPL'd version of Identity Server, which means that since the RPL is viral, any of the software that uses this template will also be subject to RPL. And this came about as quite a shock because you'd think Microsoft would want to go ahead and you know, be in a position where um, everything that was uh, open source as part of these templates would all be licensed under MIT or Apache 2 or some other similarly friend, you know, commercially friendly license. But no, uh, instead they decided to go ahead and stick with Identity Server as the component of their choice. And they mentioned this little caveat down here, which is that the license allows it to be used free for development, testing and learning, free for non-commercial open source and free for use in commercial settings if the entity or organization makes less than $1 million per year. Okay, so this should have shaved pretty much all of the outrage, and I'm gonna explain why it didn't, but this should have shaved all of the outrage out of this picture in one fell swoop right here. Because the normal people who complain about pricing in terms of, well, we can't afford this, tend to be developers working at very cash-strapped startups, developers working in, let's say, countries of the lower standard of living where a million dollars a year is a lot more there than it is in a place like you know, the UK or the United States. Uh, and therefore that you know, effective ceiling or yeah, ceiling is a lot higher for them. Uh, or it's people who are students who might want to use the technology or researchers, blah, blah, blah. So, Identity Server basically carved out a caveat that lets all those folks go ahead and use the product with zero RPL virality risk. So the only people who are left paying are commercial entities that are using the latest version of Identity Server and ASP.NET in a commercial setting. You can still use Identity Server 4 if you want to. And if you can find a way to make it roll forward, the new version of ASP.NET, yeah, more power to you. That's still licensed. Uh, under a you know commercially friendly open source license, but it's going to stop being professionally supported uh, by the Duende team in uh, November 2022. So let's see what the peanut gallery had to say about these changes on what has recently become quite a hot little area for Flame Wars, the .NET GitHub organization. 
So Barry goes, summarizes it. Uh, reception seems to be mostly positive. We're going to go ahead and take a look at thumbs up here. Um, now we get down to, here we go, the fun stuff. Being one of many that opted to use Identity Server due to its open source nature, it just really feels like a bait and switch, especially since the project was included in official templates and used in the official .NET Core documentation. Really wished I hadn't have used it. All right. Bait and switch in open source does happen. Uh, bait and switch is when you attract a bunch of people to the project under one license, and then you go ahead and you change to, let's say, a more aggressive commercial license down the road. And so you lured people in with one promise, and then you gave them something else after the project gained some steam and they took independency on it. So technically speaking, uh, this internet commenter is, is, is right that the identity server team did change their open source uh, licensing model from one that was permissive to one that was commercial. But here's what they did. They tried to make identity servers sustainable by accepting donations. And I think they supplemented their income by doing lots of training and services and other stuff around it. And ultimately came to the conclusion that given the level of effort that the project requires, the only way to go ahead and try to make it commercially viable is to actually go and charge the end users of the software and to go ahead and receive some value in return from that. Now, um, that means that the choice you really had wasn't between free and paid. It was between free and nothing, which is that the project dies, uh, the developers move on, no one maintains it, and it becomes abandonware. And you hope that Microsoft steps into it, steps in to fill that role. And by the way, I have some bad news. If you're hoping Microsoft steps in to fill that role, I know exactly what they're going to recommend. And it's called Azure Active Directory, which guess what? Costs money. So you're going to end up paying for a solution one way or another. You can only go ahead and depend on the charity of other people for so long, right? Now, lo and behold, there is, in fact, a commercial alternative to this, this open IDIC core down here, which, you know, basically has been around for a number of years. You can go ahead and use that. But guess what? You're basically kind of moving the problem from one place to another. If Identity Server, with all the support they had, all the visibility they had of the .NET ecosystem, had these types of sustainability problems, how long before all the freeloaders from, you know, well, actually, it's the, real, the really pro kind of the proper term is probably free riders. How long before the free riders from the uh, identity server ecosystem come over to the open IDIC system and strip mine that? So if we go ahead and take a look, let's take a look at the release cadence for uh, commit two days ago, did a release eight days ago. Let's go ahead and take a look at their insights. Okay. It's literally one guy holding this project together. Kevin Chalet. Uh, let's see. Yep. So it's basically Kevin. So number one committer, 858. Next committer, eight. That's not even close. It's a one-man project. Kevin gets hit by a bus. Open Idict is over. And let's take a look at their sponsorship data. Um, if I really want to sponsor, let's see. 17 sponsors are funding Kevin Chalet's work. And I don't see a goal setting in here, but I'm going to go ahead and assume that he's probably earning, let's say, per sponsor. Let's go ahead and assume he's doing, you know, $10 per sponsor, which would actually be kind of high. Well, that'd be $170 a month, uh, which would come out to, oh, less than $2,000 a year, my if my math's correct. So not going to make the break, not, not going to go ahead and make bank anytime soon doing that exactly. Now, I hope this project's successful. Hope he's able to maintain it. And I hope people who genuinely, you know, um, disagree with Identity Server's long-term direction, I hope those folks are successful getting on board an open edict. But the fact that they're kind of overlooking the total cost of ownership of how much value they've gotten out of something like Identity Server is ridiculous. Um, I Just because I'm lazy, I want to go ahead and mine some of the other uh, shitty comments on here real fast. So let's see. This is Brock, the other founder of Identity Server. 
Let's see, other people doing this. The one I really want to go ahead and find is the people who said that it would be really easy for them to code their own alternative to identity server. Um, so yeah, let me see if I can find that. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Well, you know what? Uh, this this isn't as interesting as I thought. I'm not going to go and data mine all that. Let's talk about, all right. So the only people who have to pay for the software are people who are going to go ahead and earn more than a million dollars a year. So, oh, I guess right here it says, for small companies or individuals less than 1 million a USD in annual revenue, free for fewer than five clients. Okay, for client, by the way, they don't literally mean a logged in user. They mean like the number of different applications talking to identity servers. So that's actually a much smaller number than they're worrying about there. Yes, identity crisis. That's right, H3. That's what we're covering tonight. Um, so here's the real reason why these people are upset. The money that identity server wants to charge. Let's take a look at Duende's buy path. If I want to go ahead and buy identity server view pricing. All right, $1,500 a year. And if I'm running, let's say, a much larger operation, $5,000 a year. And then if I, if I have, I don't know, a giant, crazy, um, you know, microservice environment with a, a billion servers that all need to go ahead and talk to the same, um, same identity server, 12,000 bucks a year. So for companies that are doing north of, let's say, a million dollars a year, this is total chump change in the grand scheme of the in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, fifteen hundred dollars a year isn't shit for being able to pay for a product that solves many orders of magnitude more than that in engineering labor and overhead to do that same thing. So why are people upset? Well, I'd argue it's two parts. One is that developers are not good at valuing their own time or estimating how difficult it is to do things. They go ahead and say, "Oh, the identity server is just a." Can I help you, Mr. Ardbeg? Sorry, cats sniffing around here. I would go ahead and argue that, by and large, they are not very good at estimating what their own time is worth or how complicated it is to implement these things. There were a number of comments talking about, well, I could build an identity server myself. And it's like, well, there's a reason why Microsoft doesn't want to build it. And that should probably give you some pause, given that they're a company with virtually infinite resources, right? So should give you some pause there. The real reason why these developers uh, are upset about this is because this forces them to have a conversation with their procurement department. One of the biggest benefits to building, let's say, an open source software business is that if you make the core of your product free, like how we do at Petabridge, or how companies like you know Confluent do with Kafka, or you know Datastax does with Cassandra, the core of their product's free. That makes it very easy for software developers to go ahead and actually start to take a dependency on it in a really like significant commercial context. Usually the ultimate killer of any type of, let's say, um, adoption is having to go through the procurement department because you basically have to sell a council of elders on why your technology choices are right, why the cost justification should be there. You have to fight for budget and you're competing against all sorts of other different priorities and that happens. And not to mention, most procurement department uh, pro you know, procure, like processes are completely insane.